to produce all the, the deviation. So regulatory tests are designed to give clear-cut discrete outputs, even if the underlying reality is not a continuum but a matrix. So then we run into the unique engineering disease. This is, this is, the, and this is the disease that is transmitted from engineers to regulators, and we call it bright lining. And this is creating or <laughs> relying on inappropriate dividing lines or classifications. I love the difference between flammable and combustible liquids. All right, and, 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 and that is used in the regulatory process. People make a huge deal about the difference between flammable and combustible liquids. And you try to find out there in the real world about things that fall on one side or the other of that line and whether it makes any difference in real fires. Nobody even wants to know because if they have to worry about that, then they've got to keep the uh, liquor in safety cans. So. And they have all this ethanol in bottles here, so we're doing our best to buy or remediate it. Um, uh, Derek, if you said a glass of whiskey, I, 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 don't, I don't think Thomas, I ever saw a glass of whiskey. So, unless it was a big glass. All right. <laughs> That's the question, what's a standard glass? Right, we get All right. Bright lining is, is, is a constant problem in the regulatory use of standards. Is that it's a very complex underlying, oh, and, and but, but, see, it's very easy to regulate because they don't know. They just don't know that that difference may be meaningless. You pick one. The best example we have, which doesn't come from fire, is they, they gave a nominal five foot nine, 160 pound passenger to the engineers when they designed the airbags, and it does perfectly well for a five foot nine, 160 pound passenger. If you're five foot four, it kills you. It breaks your neck. Okay. In other words, no one told them that that was the midpoint on a standard distribution of passenger size. They designed precisely for a five foot nine, 160 pound person. Bingo! Right there, declared themselves satisfied. See the same thing in fire a lot of times. The final step is, is, is a two part thing. There's the validation and verification of regulatory tests. Uh, these are terms used by the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and they are becoming more widely used in the regulatory system in the United States. Verification means the test actually classifies the variable it's assumed to test. You have to say what the test is supposed to test, and this is a question of whether this is an adequate test of that variable, and that's verification. Verification is necessary, but not sufficient condition for a test. Validation establishes that the variables being tested are actually relevant to the safety hazard, and that requires real-world understanding. In other words, it's a laboratory. Verification is a laboratory-type exercise, but validation is a real-world exercise. And validation is more difficult, and you have to do it continuously over the lifetime of the standard to show that the standard remains valid despite innovations. And validation and verification are separate activities. Okay, for verification, the test has to be a robust method of measuring a true variable. The repeatability of the test is a necessary but insufficient criteria. And validation is demonstrating the accuracy of the variable in addressing a real-world problem that it's designed to solve. The other step is when you do validation, verification, and avoid reification. So, reification, which is related to bright lining, is the inappropriate treatment of the output of the test as a description of the properties of the object in the real world. All right, reification fallacy is believing the test scores describe an inherent attribute, and the test is a measure of the attribute. Okay, rather than that, the test score is a joint product of the test method and sample, which may or may not reflect an actual attribute. In other words, you have to, reification is a, is a, was identified, and the word most widely used by Stephen Gould in his The Mismeasure of Man on IQ tests. In other words, the mere fact that you get reproducible IQ results from people on paper and pencil tests does not mean that IQ is a real thing. You're, you're not necessarily measuring a real thing, you're only getting a score. You have to, if you're going to say that you're actually measuring something, you have to show independently this is the issue of ground truth, that you're actually measuring something that really exists. For example, I, I see the SBI uses to start testing the fire resistance or flame resistance or even reaction to fire. If you see that, the test is being reified. The statement assumes that that attribute exists and this is a test method for it. There is no basis for making that assumption. That's the reification fallacy. An industry publication I saw. The fire resistance of new construction, according to you, was assessed with an SBI. You can't say that. You're not assessing the fire resistance. You know, whatever fire resistance is, is not measured by the FBI. All right, the, the FBI, in its own description, says it's a method of test for determining the reaction of fire, a method of test. 
it as a method of classifying. In no way, shape, or form does it say it tests any underlying attribute. It's simply a method of legally classifying things. It's irrelevant to engineering. It's just absolutely irrelevant because it isn't designed to test anything. It, it doesn't even claim to measure things. It's a regulatory result. We're well familiar with regulatory tests. They have no, not necessarily any meaning whatever in engineering. The regulatory tests by which we allow cars to be sold in the United States have nothing to do with designing for safety and accidents. We know that. All right. Now, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent to have the test is a separate question. But you can't say, in other words, that's the Titanic defense. We complied with the government regulation, but the regulatory test would be worthless. I've done a lot of work on icing and the ATR and crashes and so forth. It's exactly the same problem. Now, the practical hazard of reification in the real world is the blind reliance by non-specialists on ratings obtained in a specific test designed for a specific purpose. Reification causes disasters. All right, where designers rely. It's exactly what the, the uh, um, NIST found in the ASTM 119 and the World Trade Center. Where people relied on a cookbook. They reified that. It's a three-hour fire rate. What the hell does that mean? Other major problems along the way. They lose track of the frame or model. The failure to document exactly what the test designers thought they were dealing with and exactly the process by which they extracted the model that then led to the test. The failure to document the process by which a test method is created and make that documentation part of the understanding and part of the, the record of the test so that when that documentation no longer reflects reality, you understand the test is invalid. Right. Inappropriate treatment of innovation. The SBI has, has, has a world-class inappropriate treatment of innovation statement. Very rarely people put such a stupid thing directly in the standard. The inappropriateness of an existing reference area has to be demonstrated in an alternative proposed. But as you also be indicated together with a suitable large-scale test to be shown to be represented in the proposed new hazard scenario. Why? Why is the why is the test presumed to be valid on innovation? That's just stupid. And this is a world-class stupid thing that they put in the SBI. In other words, to put the burden of proof on the person saying the test is meaningless. Once you've shown the test is meaningless, the test is meaningless. You don't have to prove it by coming up with a better test. Very simply, public safety in the single market requires designers and operators to take on and be fully responsible for the safe design of their building. When I see a performance-based design, I want to see it say, this building meets necessary standard for safety, not it meets compliance with this code requirement. Because that means lawyers are designing it, and we know how scary that is. <laughs> All right? So the engineers have to take on the burden of saying it's safe. Okay? Do not pretend that compliance with a construction product vector automatically produces safe buildings. There's absolutely no reason to believe that. Okay, I think I did this in 25 minutes. And I, I want to say a special thanks to Jim Fintieri, who you may not know is I think retiring this year, and, um, uh, and who started me down this, uh, this path. Thank you very much. I guess it's questions.